live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, September 13th, 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. Time for another frog in the throat. Uh, I wish someone would boil this frog already and <laughs> get rid of it. I'm tired of this thing. And uh, it always waits for 9 o'clock to show up. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But uh, no coincidence, I'm sure, being as it is time to begin the show. Uh, a little bit distracted, of course. President's crazy. And uh, total a-hole, so, you know, it's a little difficult to get things started. Uh, he has uh, just burnt up the internet by tweeting that uh, his his belief, anyway, that no, 3,000 people did not die in the two hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico. He says it this way, when I left the island, you see, it's all about him. When I left the island, after the storm had hit, they had anywhere from 6 to 18 deaths, plus another 1,000 as time went by, it did not go up by much. Then, a long time later, they started to report really large numbers, like 3,000. And uh, he ends it with an ellipsis, and uh, I'm not sure where he's going next. And it may take up to 20 minutes to find out where he's going next. We will see. Ah, uh, no. Okay, he began this one 25 minutes ago. Now, it is 13 minutes since his follow-up. This was done, he says, by the Democrats in order to make me look as bad as possible when I was successfully raising billions of dollars to help rebuild Puerto Rico. If a person died for any reason, like old age, just add them onto the list. Bad politics. I love Puerto Rico. So there you have it. Blah, 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 etc. It's, you know, despicable as usual. Uh, probably a little bit more despicable than most of what he spends his day doing. Uh, not particularly brilliant as another uh, hurricane bears down on the United States. And you can just see people in the White House just smacking their foreheads. Why, why, why are you bringing this up now when, you know, I don't think potentially the same thing is likely to happen here, but why would you put people's minds on the death tolls of this hurricane? I mean, just from the political standpoint alone. Uh, I did see, let's see, it was a Josh Barrow earlier uh, observing, you know, the one thing that Trump had going for him, if you can call it that, on the uh, on the hurricanes that, that destroyed Puerto Rico was that people, uh, the, the media, for some reason, were just unwilling largely, and I mean, certainly members of the media who, who, who bring it up all the time, but... It, by and large, it was not the obsession of the media, let's say, to the level that it was an obsession of the media to discuss Hillary Clinton's emails. It was not a, a, an obsession of the media to discuss the incredible damage and the incredible death toll there. And he had somehow skated on this. He basically gotten away with it. And now he's like, well, let's make sure that reporters who are covering the current hurricane remember or realize if they never knew in the first place just how many people died on my watch there and you can't really understand it from a political perspective it certainly doesn't make any sense from a presidential perspective in terms of you know like being a person that americans should be able to depend on to respond to emergencies honestly and earnestly but here we are uh, yeah, here it is. Josh Barrow saying the one thing Trump had going for him politically on Hurricane Maria was the media wasn't obsessively discussing the death count. So now Genius Boy decides to change that. And uh, wow, it's uh, it's a little bit surprising, except yeah, the president's demented and uh, incapacitated by his, dis his mental disability. And I guess it's to be expected at some point. Uh, like every single day, every single hour. And here we are watching it happen in real time. Alex Seitzwald uh, commenting on it as presidents for Hurricane Maria truth. Boy, oh boy. And of course, uh, just one more. We might as well just add to the pile here of people uh, guilty of the same infraction 
but uh, lecturing everybody else about how the true proper response to the president's idiotic tweets is not to retweet it, even with a commentary on it, because, of course, uh, we are assuming when we retweet it that uh, everyone knows it's not true, and that's not actually the case. James Poniewozik, uh, whose name there's no chance I've gotten correct, but uh, you all probably know who he is from Twitter. The Trump tweet everyone is RTing, denying 3,000 deaths in Puerto Rico is wrong. Here's the story. I get the impulse to RT when the POTUS is tweeting something nuts, but don't just assume, quote, everyone knows it's not true, unquote, when spreading his disinformation. And I'm not certain whether that's a lecture on retweeting it in under any circumstances, as some people will lecture you to do. You can't retweet it along with a lecture about why it's not true or whatever, because something, something, and it helps disseminate the information. Other people say don't inflate the retweet numbers, whatever. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm getting a little bit, of, I'm getting a little tired of that lecture, to be honest, when you see so many people doing that all the time and, and then occasionally realizing, oh, I'm inflating his retweet numbers or I'm helping spread disinformation or somehow they think that their comment about it, it corrects the record, whereas everyone else's comments are uh, just not up to the task, I guess. The story that he links to is the link about, well, the, the New York Times report about the actual honest-to-God true death toll there. So I, I know that. And I guess you're supposed to attach that now, although the, the hot new trend is also not to inflate his retweet numbers. Take a screenshot of his tweet and include that there. It's important to have context, I think, when you retweet these things. Uh, and, and I guess that's a, a thing you could do if you're interested in, in spending the time on making sure that President Moron's retweet numbers don't go higher than they should. But uh, I'm only barely and occasionally interested in doing that. And very often the thing's happening on your phone and it's just simply so enormously inconvenient to worry about one additional retweet that uh, I just rather make the comment already. Anyway, it's a it's a disastrous way to start the day. Uh, locally speaking, we doesn't look like we'll be impacted very much by the hurricane at all, which is a nice change of pace, I guess, for us here. Uh, the more southerly path, of course, as we mentioned yesterday, appears to be set to, well, cover uh, large parts of the Carolinas with pig feces so that seems like a fun way to spend the weekend good luck with that uh don't know exactly how if is, I, is there anything at all that could be done about that i guess not i mean you just you have giant lagoons of pig waste and uh i don't know it's not like you can just uh drain that swamp i guess although if you'd like to run a pipeline uh the president is big into pipelines i think you could probably pipe it directly into well, I was going to say the White House, but I don't want you to ruin that. Trump Tower, I guess, would be the place to go. Not that he's ever there. Um, I would suggest the golf clubs, but of course that means bringing it here. So uh, if you wanted to put it at the Bedminster Club or down at Mar-a-Lago, I, I couldn't object, but I have a feeling that the uh, the civic leagues down in Palm, Palm Beach would be able to beat us on that one. All right. It's... Uh, I don't know. Uh, do, do we even bother going on with the rest of the show? We just say at this point, the president uh, is running around denying that thousands of people died in a hurricane disaster, partly of his own making. And uh, it's time for this guy to be tossed out on his ass already. And we'll just have to do our best in the upcoming midterm elections to make that possible. <sighs> All right. Michael Musson comments that this must be that the goal is to distract people from how he will mishandle this next hurricane, uh, plus how he diverted money from the Coast Guard to child prisons. Another great story yesterday, yes, also uh, made the rounds that uh, Trump had diverted or uh, reprogrammed some amount of the budget dedicated for, well, in one case, the Coast Guard, and in another case, for FEMA, and uh, diverted it to ICE, that uh, at this point most hated of 
federal agencies so that they could continue with their ridiculous policies of uh, border detentions, uh, raids, uh, immigration raids, uh, hundreds of miles inland, and of course, separating kids from their parents and putting them in baby prisons. Well, you know, he's he's single-minded. We at least have that. I don't know. I, I, he's, he's, he's a dedicated sociopath, I suppose. Uh, it's nice he can keep focus, though, at this age. What can you say about a guy like this? All right. Uh, many other stories that we ought to catch up on and many other hot takes to add to the pile here. Uh, let's see. There's a couple. I mean, it's all at this point in my uh, in pocket, almost all hot takes on just how crazy Trump is and the many reasons why it's OK to say that. Let's see. I have this one. This is an interesting entry in all this, uh, as opposed to the dozens of pundit takes on this. This is a piece written by Barbara Race. Uh, who's, I don't know how she pronounces that R-E-S last name, but you may recognize it. She uh, worked for Trump for many years and basically, uh, well, she was, I think, for a long time, the highest ranking uh, woman executive in the Trump organization. And she had a pretty prominent role, uh, you know, in her time there. And uh, in other words, she's, in in latter days, she's been used as the shield by Trump. You know, I am not a misogynist. I support all sorts of that, all sorts of women's stuff. I had this woman working for me for many years in a very high-ranking position. And so, therefore, none of the other things that I do, like molest teenage pageant uh, contestants, is, is real. Uh, or, but if it is, by the way, you should come by my room later. Uh... Not saying I actually did it, but uh, here's my key. Uh, but ignore all of that, because this woman once worked for me. Anyway, this is what she has to say these days about the experience. In the New York Daily News, Trump and his flunkies, why aren't staffers standing up to him? It's an interesting question. Uh, why does he have staffers is another good question. And why is he not in a mental institution? You know, these sorts of things occur to me from time to time. On this particular day, let's see, uh, we have uh, the story yeah, begins cold like that. On this particular day, the architect had come to Donald Trump's office to show him what the interior of the residential elevator cabs would look like, I guess, for a Trump Tower. Trump looked at the panels where the buttons you push to reach a floor were located. Yes, that's how an elevator is laid out. He noticed that next to each number were some little dots. What's this? Trump asked. Braille, the architect replied. Trump told the architect to take it off. Get rid of it. We can't, the architect said. It's the law. Get rid of the, and it says expletive here, get rid of the expletive Braille. No blind people are going to live in Trump Tower. Just do it, Trump yelled back, calling him weak. You're weak. Get rid of the Braille. So weak. And you can, of course, picture him doing this. This actually I found very insightful. Not that this this part I, I, I already knew. Trump hates everybody and he hates everybody who isn't him. No blind people are going to live in Trump Tower. There's no rich blind people. Everybody knows that. You got to have great eyes, great puffy chameleon eyes like me in order to be successful. No blind people are going to live in Trump Tower. Not only is that a ridiculous thing to say. I mean, no blind people are going to visit Trump Tower. Who cares? What's the difference for another thing? So there's dots on the buttons, you know. Well, I'm very into the aesthetics of everything. I, I can see by the way you decorate your uh, hotel and your residential towers like a, uh, you know, I don't know what, a cake, a cake boss on peyote. But anyway... The more the architect protested, the angrier Trump got. Oh, yes, I meant to say this is the part that, that really intrigued me was that he calls him weak at the end of this. Like, there's dots on my buttons. You're weak. What? I mean, he just likes to say you're weak to people because he thinks 
I don't know. I mean, it's funny. It's as you you're supposed to. He thinks it bothers people, and then you say that, that it's so ridiculous it doesn't bother me. But here it is bothering me, right? So he must be right. It's just one of those dumb things that honestly you thought that bullies would have outgrown in like I don't know eighth ninth grade. You're weak. The more the architect protested, the angrier Trump got. Donald liked to pick on this guy. And here's where we learn why this is happening. As a general rule, Trump thought architects and engineers were weak as compared to construction people. And he loved to torment weak people. So there's a lot going on here. One, of course, I mean, I guess in the sense that uh, architects and engineers don't do the physical labor they might be considered, I mean, you might consider that they were weak as compared to construction people, but uh, Trump's not a construction guy either, so I don't know what he's thinking, like somehow he's strong because raw construction. I build things, I pay people to build things. And in fact, I don't pay people to build things. I make them build it and then I take their presumably strong bodies and destroy them with asbestosis and whatever. And uh, then I don't pay them. But I don't know why he considers himself one of the strong construction people. And then, of course, uh, what kind of an attribute is it in a president that he loves to torment weak people? It's supposed to be, you know, you're fighting for, you know, the line out of uh, a few good men, right? We fight for people who can't fight for themselves. But now he loves to torment weak people. But did he think the architect would remove the braille from the panels? Never. This is the, the truly interesting part, the truly interesting insight that she gives us. He never thought that that was going to be complied with. He just wanted to pick on the architect and needle him and call him weak, which is very, very interesting. That he, This isn't something he really wants to get done. He just wants to torment a person that he thinks is weak, not to have anything happen, not to get his way on anything, just to get his jollies. We have so many problems in this country. So many problems in this country are caused by Donald Trump's jollies. We should end this problem immediately. Now, she continues on. I had seen him do this kind of thing before and would again. He would say whatever came into his head. Ordering an underling to do something that was impossible gave Trump the opportunity to castigate a subordinate and also blame him for anything that, quote, went wrong in connection with the unperformed order. Later, a Trump-style win-win. I guess see the non-construction of the wall, and that's going to become, uh, what's her name, Kirsten Nielsen's fault. And any, uh, any number of other things that he has promised to do very strongly, but which won't happen, and he can just blame on somebody else. This is his favorite game, but that's really interesting. Trump did this with outrageous or just plain stupid ideas, both legal and illegal. Sometimes those lines were blurred. No, yeah, no kidding. Uh, when he asked me to do something that could not be done, I often fought back, but always at a cost. Sometimes I just did what he asked, planning for the necessary fix or damage control later. But many times I played along with him and then didn't carry out his order. Aha! So now we know what's prompted this. So when I saw the snippets of Bob Woodward's book and the anonymous op-ed piece, I wasn't surprised. To an extent, Trump has always relied on people not to follow his most ridiculous orders. Hmm. For instance, he would expect people to lie for him. Did they? Sometimes. I did. If he wanted me to tell the workers that Elton John was going to need the presidential suite at the plaza by a certain time to push them to get it done, I went along. I knew there was really no deadline, and I was and was certainly no Elton John. I wrote in the Trump Tower offering plan, that is, sales of the condos to uh, initial buyers of the Trump Tower uh, places, I wrote in the Trump Tower offering plan that the marble in the bathrooms was luxurious when I knew it was really made with pieces of marble and crushed marble along with glue called an aggregate. 
So, in other words, it was cheap second grade stuff, but instead, you know, puffery, right? You're right in the offer. Oh, it's made with luxurious marble. But, she says, I refuse to say that the Bonwit Teller building was functionally obsolete as he wanted me to. The Bonwit Teller building was uh, the department store building that they tore down in order to make room for construction of, of Trump Tower. Trump is not really all that different now, but the stakes are higher. And there aren't many order refusers anymore either. Off the record, staffers tell reporters that Trump is out of control. But what have they done to try to control him? Steal a memo off his desk so he will forget to sign it? How about not preparing the memo in the first place? And who refuses to lie for him when he makes his outrageous claims? I guess fewer and fewer people now. Uh, are willing to refuse to do that. It's uh, it's interesting that this even comes up. And I guess, well, one answer to, uh, well, you steal a memo off his desk so he'll forget to sign it. Why about, what about not writing it in the first place? Well, I'm sure one person wrote it and the other person said, oh my God, I just heard it's been written and stole it off the desk. But yes, I get the point. Not enough resistors inside of his administration. So, Who refuses to lie for him when he makes his outrageous claims? They are not saying something silly like Princess Diana is buying an apartment in Trump Tower. Apparently that was a big stupid, you know, one of the one of the many stupid lies that he used to sell units at the time. They are bigger things. She says they are misleading and deceiving the American public on matters of great importance but he just handles it like it was a real estate transaction. The just do it's are getting done and they are not directed at carpenters and painters or fan magazines. Now they are about alienating allies, cozying up to dictators and employing dangerous nonsensical economic tactics. The self-aggrandizing anonymous wants the world to know that there are adults in the room. Really? She concludes what the hell are they doing that's an interesting perspective on all of this uh notes at the end of the piece here say that uh, race who is the former vice president in charge of construction at the trump organization is the author of all alone on the 68th floor how one woman changed the face of construction sounds like an interesting entry Uh, if you can fit it in in between the other books you're doubtless trying to cram your way through but uh yeah i I, it's mostly interesting for that observation that trump very rarely actually thinks that his stupid orders are going to be called out or or, uh, carried out he thinks that he can rely on people to know that these things are not supposed to be carried out and to to i guess avoid the worst damage by exercising their own common sense and not executing these orders. But that becomes a lot more difficult. Well, one, if you don't have a working history with him uh, the way she does. And two, if you're either new to working with him uh, or not, uh, he's the president of the United States. And it's a much different thing than it is to say, well, here's this privileged moron uh, inheritance boy builder uh, developer who says just get it done you know just tell the workers that elton john wants the presidential suite so that they finish it up and that's a not a big deal and b who cares about defying the orders of some rich developer moron in new york he wasn't really even that big of a deal at the time he was making a big splash in the papers but that's it and you'd lose your job i guess suppose uh, possibly and that is a, a huge deal in your world but it's uh, it's not the same thing as it is to. I mean, what's the crime in not carrying out the orders of a moron developer? He can fire you, yes, but you're not going to be charged with any kind of a crime. But not not following the orders of the president of the United States that has greater implications. There's like constitutional implications to it when uh, subordinates decide on their own as appointed anonymous officials accountable to no one to carry out or not carry out the orders of 
a supposedly elected president. Now, you could argue, hey, my, the guy's not been elected, and so uh, it's not a big deal. But you'd have an uphill battle in the courts, which are still, I think, at this point, obligated to recognize the authority of the Electoral College, as foolish as that is. I thought that was a very interesting entry and a very interesting insight into what he's doing. And I hope they circulate that around in the White House. And maybe maybe things will get better, but he, it won't stop him, of course, from disrupting everything with his idiotic comments every morning. That's, I guess, why he loves Twitter so much, is that uh, he can order a stupid thing announced to the public and there's no opportunity for layers of staffers to change his mind for him and withhold that stupid statement. He can issue it right away and walk away from it thereafter. All right, let's see. We're coming up, bumping up against the uh, first break. We can tease you with this piece, which uh, The Hill sent around yesterday, with what is doubtless meant to be a vicious trolling headline to get you to click. But if you click through, you'll actually find that there's something hmm, somewhat worthwhile uh, noting here. The headline they're using here, Donald Trump may stun America with shocking November surprise. Okay, that's worrisome. It's the sort of thing that makes you think, oh, it's, uh, it's in the hill. It could very easily be some arch conservative Trumpster type uh, writing an article about how, uh, you know, you all thought Donald Trump was going to get crushed in the November 2016 election. Well, I have news for you. He's got magic powers and uh, uh, amazing populist appeal that are going to bring out infrequent voters and he's going to hold on to Congress and all of this is going to be validated. But as it turns out, I clicked through. I couldn't help it. I wanted to see what this was all about. And on the other side, well, they fooled me. It was a very different kind of article and I will uh, tell you all about it after I think it through and maybe try to decide not to do it in two minutes. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And uh, time now to stun you with the article that uh, I borrow the same word from. Donald Trump may stun America with shocking November surprise. But guess what? Surprise. It's not the surprise that I feared it was, although it, well, it is actually. It's not the one I was presently, at the time I read the headline, fearing. It's a very different one. It is actually written not by arch-conservative Trumpster, uh, a, an arch-conservative Trumpster person, but rather by former Congressman Steve Israel, who no doubt will strike some of you as at least a little too conservative for your tastes. But this is an interesting perspective, and it immediately, uh, you know, whatever you might think of him, it, it in all likelihood tells you, uh, I doubt very much that this is going to be about the secret popularity and the silent majority coming out to validate the Trump agenda in the midterm elections. And it's not. It's scarier than that. And, uh, well, we might as well put it out there. Because, we'll, uh, hey, it could happen. Only two months away from the midterm elections, is it far-fetched to consider whether President Trump would try to invalidate the results if Democrats win the House. Brace yourselves, armed with the gavel in one hand and subpoenas in the other, a House Democratic majority represents an existential threat to Trump's presidency. I have my doubts about that, although I'll take it. It uh, 
at least represents some kind of threat to Trump's presidency. Although, uh, like I said, I'll be there voting to make sure that there is a Democratic majority in the House and ho- uh, hoping against hope, but that there would be one in the Senate as well. But um, I have seen and been disappointed in, greatly disappointed in, Democratic oversight before, but it's a damn sight better than what we've got. So, you know, do I have any doubts about casting that ballot? No, none whatsoever. I'm absolutely going to be doing it. You will be too. And uh, then I hold on and hope for the best and do my best to uh, keep a level head and, and occasionally, I guess, jump in and educate to the extent possible, to the extent that's necessary, those Democrats conducting the oversight. Because the truth is, very frequently, the members of Congress have very little understanding of how far they can go in that role and what their powers, the extent, of, what the extent of their powers actually are. And then, of course, there's the political considerations that hamstring them all the time. Okay, but he says, brace yourselves. Armed with the gavel in one hand and subpoenas in the other, a House Democratic majority represents an existential threat to Trump's presidency. House Democrats will be able to look at his business dealings, his still secret tax returns. These are all true things. His financial relationships around the world and whether he's using the White House to generate windfall profits for his private enterprises. This is all good. And even if they can't by themselves do anything about it, it is good to see it exposed. Again, another good reason to make sure that you show up in November. So far, Trump has browbeaten members of his own administration for seeming to uphold the rule of law. He can threaten to fire Attorney General Jeff Sessions, but he can't fire a House Democratic majority. Or can he? Seriously, that's what this is about. Remember the third presidential debate of 2016? Uh, No! I don't, not particularly, but I'm sure you do. When Trump was asked about absolutely accepting the results of the election? Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that one now. Okay. His answer was, what I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time. I will keep you in suspense which was just the most outrageous thing you could possibly have said. And it's it's the same stupid line he's repeated a number of times about things important and not important. The, I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm, I'll tell you. We'll see what happens. I'll keep you in suspense. Again, a thing that he thinks is okay to do because he did it throughout his life as a con man slash business somewhat uh, man and developer, etc. It's the sort of thing you can get away with in private business, even if your business is uh, stealing money from other people and bankrupting them. But yeah, you can get away with that. And as president, you know, or as a candidate, you're not really supposed to do things the same way, but there's no law against it. So he goes ahead and gets away with it. A day later, Israel continues, With the story of this potential rebuke of the democratic process spreading, Trump clarified his remarks at a rally. I would like to promise and pledge to all of my voters and supporters and to all of the people of the United States that I will totally accept the results of this great and historic presidential election if I win. Amazing. Amazing. Trump won. And we never learned if his words were mere bluster, as maybe Barbara Rice might have said, or a foreshadowing of how he would have reacted to an electoral loss. Even in victory, the president baselessly asserted that he would have won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally, despite zero evidence to substantiate this. And a since-disbanded council that found nothing to support his claim the president's base likely considers this accusation to be gospel. Already, Trump is setting the stage for a sweeping delegitimization. It's a word that we say fairly frequently, but not today. I'm working on getting off of the caffeine, and it's bad news. Already, Trump is setting the stage for a sweeping delegitimization 
of a House Democratic majority. And you can see this coming. I mean, it's, it's not hard to envision. Uh, in July, he tweeted, I'm very concerned that Russia will be fighting very hard to have an impact on the coming election. Based on the fact that no president has been tougher on Russia than me, they will be pushing very hard for the Democrats. They definitely don't want Trump. And that was a weird signal, wasn't it? And uh, does anybody have any doubts about what Trump would do if he knew that the Russians really were interfering in the elections but had been busy denying it? Uh, you, I, I don't think it would take any convincing at all for most people to come to believe that the plan all along was to uh, deny it until it became undeniable. And if it became undeniable in the context of a Democratic win, you could simply say, you know what, you're right. They've been interfering in elections. That's how the Democrats won. And if the Democrats don't win in the election, he can continue to deny it. Nothing ever becomes truly undeniable for him. There is just is no, you know, there's no low he won't sink to. Witness what he was tweeting this morning about, uh, no, nobody died in that hurricane. That was a whole Democratic lie. So now Steve Israel has got us a little concerned here. Now, like I said, he... Uh, he, he, he sent this tweet in July, basically setting that up and saying, basically, if Democrats win, I will accuse the uh, Dems of having won illegitimately and of colluding with the Russians. Now, could he make a, a 180 degree pivot like that without missing a beat? Well, that's what was described to us in the Woodward book, which we referred to yesterday when... Uh, Steve Bannon and David Bossie confronted him with his record of voting in Republican primaries. You know, I voted every time. That's a lie. That's an effing lie. It's a total lie, he said, uh, as quoted by Woodward, when Bossie told him, yeah, you hardly ever vote in primaries. And then I just told you I have your voting record right here. All right, fine. You've got me dead to rights. Oh, yes, you're right. And then he just moves on from there. No, there's no admission of his being wrong, no apology for having said that uh, the things that Balsey had to say were total effing lies. But keep that line in mind. Anyway, that's uh, that's how easy it will be for him to pivot. So there he is in July saying, oh, I think if the Democrats win, it will be because they're colluding with Russia, basically. And this despite the likelihood that a House Democratic majority with the ability to pass tougher sanctions against Russian meddling in our regime is actually Putin's nightmare here, as uh, Israel comments. Last week, he continues, Trump told evangelical leaders that if Democrats win the midterm elections, quote, they will overturn everything that we've done and they'll do it quickly, and this is important, and violently. And uh, he'll claim later on, oh, you know, that's a figure of speech, violently. Uh, but in the meantime, he's got his supporters worried that there'll be actual violence and he'll continue to say that he believes that there'll be actual violence and that his supporters should react, well, let's say with violence, if necessary, or at least to be prepared to do so. And until that happens, if people are to call him out on it, he'll say, uh, just a figure of speech. Now, apply his rhetoric to the very real possibility that with so many closely competitive races, election night may be long and uncertain. Remember the special election in Ohio's 12th district on August 13th? In what was assumed to be a comfortable Republican district, the outcome was too close to call for nearly three weeks. Or how about the race last November that decided control of the Virginia House of Delegates? The Democratic candidate initially won by a single vote. Following a recount, the race was determined to be a tie. A court determined that the election would be determined by a drawing, specifically of the candidates' names out of a bowl. Finally, in January, the Republican candidate's name was drawn, and the Republicans now maintain a very narrow majority in Virginia's lower house. Even if a blue wave occurs, Republican redistricting advantages have been fortified or have fortified many seats, making them more competitive than they should be in a toxic environment for their party. Imagine if this unimaginable president 
seeks to muddle the results of close counts in the midterms. He could claim that House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Russia's Vladimir Putin cooked the outcome, encourage defeated Republicans not to accept defeat, demand that friendly state chief election officials take their time in determining a winner based on whatever baseless, unsubstantiated theories the president advances. What happens on January 3rd, 2019, when, in the throes of disorganization, the House attempts to organize itself? What if Trump refuses to recognize the election of a House Democratic majority or the selection of a Democratic speaker? A lot of what happens and what ifs, but in this administration, what else is new? It's a good question. Trump is a president badly in need of a foil in his presumed campaign for re-election. He could respond to every investigation, subpoena, and act of Congress as the acts of an illegitimate, unelected Congress. Just as he refused to accept the number of votes he received in 2016, and just as he refused to accept the number of people who attended his inauguration in 2017, he can refuse to recognize the number of Democratic seats in 2019. Prepare yourselves for two years of tweets about the fake Congress. And I think he may have a point at that. And uh, wow, what a situation that's going to be. And I don't know. I, you can't put it past him. He may very well do exactly that. Unimaginable, but yet somehow quite easy to imagine with Donald Trump in mind. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay. Trying to get rid of this thing and uh, also uh, trying and failing to use the the mute button once again, failing us. So pardon me. I'm sorry about that. Thought I'd be able to get away with that one without blowing out your eardrums. Anyway, let's see. Wow. Much more to uh, look into here. And I know that I had a piece here. Uh, I meant to put aside the Daily Coast piece on this. And I think Mark Sumner had written that one up. So I'm going to go uh, searching, flipping through the stories from yesterday. Uh, I do have a story on it, and I think maybe, uh, I don't know whether this was Mark's uh, inspiration for the piece, but I have a BuzzFeed News report on this one. But I'd much rather read from Mark's take on this thing if I can find it relatively quickly, although that's unlikely to happen. But uh, I don't know. I, I hit it. I definitely remember clicking to put it in pocket. And uh, I have my doubts about how well that's working. But, uh, you know, uh, who knows? Maybe the button didn't, uh, my, my mute button didn't work. So maybe my click on the pocket button uh, wasn't everything that I thought it was going to be. Let's see. I'm still scrolling back here. But if I can't find this thing quickly, we'll have to resort to starting with the BuzzFeed News one. Boy, this was a longer time ago than I thought, eh? Well, Here's Mark Sumner's, uh, well, let's see, the last thing he put up on the uh, front page or that made it to the front page was, let's say, Trump announces new sanctions against election interference. Good thing that's never happened. Uh, but let me look at the rest of his stories here so I can more quickly find this other piece, if that's what happens. Let's see. He's writing about the hurricane, uh, coal consumption, There's plenty of things here. Then the election interference one. Here we are. Finally, suspicious activity reports flag transactions that may be connected to Trump Tower Russia meeting. I just wanted his take on this thing, even though he refers, as predicted, to the BuzzFeed report on that story. The Trump Tower meeting in which Donald Trump's top campaign staff conspired with a group of Russian operatives to exchange information helpful to Trump in the 2016 election was followed by a series of mysterious financial transactions that may be connected to actions at that meeting. BuzzFeed reports that these financial transactions surfaced when financial institutions were instructed to search for suspicious behavior by people connected to the broader Trump-Russia investigation. The result was a series of suspicious activity reports, several of them timed within the days after the Trump Tower meeting and connected with those involved. 
These transactions are centered around billionaire Aras Agalarov, Trump's partner in both the 2013 Miss Universe pageant and in various schemes to bring a Trump Tower to Moscow. It was Rob Goldstone, a publicist for Agalarov's son, who first contacted Donald Trump Jr. to arrange the Trump Tower meeting, and it was also Agalarov and his son who squired Trump around Moscow in the infamous post-pageant weekend when he may or may not have taken some actions that were later reported to Christopher Steele. Hmm, you know what they are. The movement of funds from Agalarov's account is confusing both in terms of purpose and recipients. However, it appears that in the days that followed the meeting, and on the very same day that Trump replaced Corey Lewandowski with Paul Manafort as the head of his campaign, Agalarov moved $19.5 million dollars from a Swiss bank using a shell company in the British Virgin Islands to a U.S. account. Where the money went from there is not clear. In the days immediately following Trump's election, Agalarov sent another $1 million to a previously dormant account in New Jersey. Examiners also found money moving back and forth between accounts belonging to publicist Goldstone and Irakli, or Ike, Kavaladze a representative of the Aguilarovs who was at the Trump Tower meeting. Through, uh, though these transactions were flagged as suspicious, it's not clear that any of them have been directly tied to illegal activity or that any of the money passed through into Trump's campaign or pocket. All that can be said at the moment is that many of the same characters who arranged for and took part in the Trump Tower meeting we're also conducting multiple high-dollar transactions, some of which clearly involved bringing money into the U.S. through shell companies in the time just after the meeting. Now, <clears throat> he continues here, Donald Trump has repeatedly claimed that he did not know of the meeting until just before the point where it was revealed to the public. Donald Trump Jr. responded to breaking news about the meeting by issuing a memo claiming that the meeting had been a short introductory meeting, primarily concerned with a program for the adoption of Russian children. Donald Trump denied having anything to do with that memo, despite reports that he had dictated the memo from Air Force One. Trump Jr. testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee that Trump did not draft the memo. However, in a January exchange with the special counsel's office, Trump's legal team admitted that he did write the short but accurate response. Hmm. After months of claiming otherwise, Trump also admitted that the purpose of the meeting was to, quote, get dirt on Hillary Clinton. So Trump lied about knowing, lied about the purpose of the meeting, and lied about writing the excuse note for the meeting. But in every instance, Trump has continued to insist that nothing came of the meeting. That's been the ultimate fallback in insisting that the meeting was not a clear instance of conspiracy, even though the test of conspiracy is not whether or not it was successful. And the meeting in which Russian operatives discussed using stolen information against Hillary Clinton was followed by both the Russians and the Trump campaign using stolen information against Hillary Clinton. So it's difficult to see what action might have resulted from the meeting that didn't actually take place. In any case, both Trump and attorney Rudy Giuliani have maintained that the meeting didn't generate further action. The transactions listed in the BuzzFeed article may show people involved in the meeting being paid for successfully arranging a get-together with Trump's campaign. They may be unrelated. They may show money that ultimately passed over to Manafort, Trump, or others connected to his campaign. None of that is clear at the moment, but follow the money remains good advice more than 45 years after Watergate, and it's clear that investigators are trying to do just that. So an interesting take on the, uh, the Trump Tower meeting piece in BuzzFeed, which uh, authored by, was authored by uh, Anthony Cormier and Jason Leopold. A series, they would put it this way, their headline is a series of suspicious money transfers followed the Trump Tower meeting. And I should say, you should, you should probably take a look at this article for yourself. I won't read all the way through it now. I did skim through it yesterday, and this is, well, essentially, having done so, I said, uh, 
you know, I could use another take on this. And when I saw that Mark had written one, I figured he could make more coherent sense of it. They, uh, I guess uh, the writers <clears throat> for BuzzFeed have, uh, I don't know whether they were under any pressure from editorial staff or legal staff to hedge things a little bit because they, uh, they, they very rightly and properly had to let us know that investigators have not said definitively what they think is going on here. So there's lots of hedging. But the style, it seemed to me, with which they hedged their bets in in this reporting made it very difficult to follow the storyline. And I figured Mark would do a considerably better job, and he did. But you should uh, be aware that the article is out there for you to review and uh, get something closer to the first hand, at least reporting uh, perspective on it, and get some of the details about which banks handled the money and for how long and what some of the shell companies' names were and see if they spark anything in in your mind. All right, let's see. Uh, Oh, this one we dealt with yesterday. And uh, this is the one. Here's one that I put aside yesterday and said, maybe we will deal with this when we have some more time. Mm, This may may require some critique. Jeffrey Rosen has a piece in The Atlantic, which I saw tweeted around yesterday along with some commentary that I I thought uh, had pretty much hit it on the nose. Not that I saved the commentary, obviously, but I think I can probably dig it up. But uh, this piece here uh, titled America is Living James Madison's Nightmare. And also under the uh, title here of Is Democracy Dying? The founders designed a government that would resist mob rule. They didn't anticipate how strong the mob could become. Jeffrey Rosen's piece is titled and subtitled in that way and illustrated with a a rendering of what's, I guess, meant to be James Madison uh, looking in dismay at his cell phone as he reads Trump's tweets. Get it? Uh Anyway, uh, the critique of the piece I thought was particularly important, but uh, did I mark down who made the critique? No, but I think maybe we can find it perhaps during the break. James Madison, the article begins, traveled to Philadelphia in 1787 with Athens on his mind. He had spent the year before the Constitutional Convention reading two trunks full of books on the history of failed democracies sent to him from Paris by Thomas Jefferson. Madison was determined in drafting the Constitution to avoid the fate of those ancient and modern confederacies, which he believed had succumbed to rule by demagogues and mobs. This was back in the days before you could simply send him some links, you see. Send him trunks full of books. Madison's reading convinced him that direct democracies, such as the Assembly in Athens, where 6,000 citizens were required for a quorum, unleashed populist passions that overcame the cool, deliberative reason prized above all by Enlightenment thinkers. In all very numerous assemblies of whatever characters composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason, he argued in the Federalist Papers, the essays he wrote, along with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, to build support for the ratification of the Constitution. Had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. Hmm. Madison and Hamilton believed that Athenian citizens had been swayed by crude and ambitious politicians who had played on their emotions. Uh Uh-oh. The demagogue Cleon was said to have seduced the assembly into being more hawkish towards Athens' opponents in the Peloponnesian War. And even the reformer Solon, have I got that right? Canceled debts and debased the currency. In Madison's view, history seemed to be repeating itself in America. After the Revolutionary War, he had observed in Massachusetts a rage for paper money, for abolition of debts, for an equal division of property. That populist rage had led to Shays' Rebellion, which pitted a band of debtors against their creditors. Madison referred to impetuous mobs as factions, when he, which he defined in Federalist Number 10 as a group united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest 
adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Factions arise, he believed, when public opinion forms and spreads quickly, but they can dissolve if the public is given time and space to consider long-term interests rather than short-term gratification. Oh well, so much for that. To prevent factions from distorting public policy and threatening liberty, Madison resolved to exclude the people from a direct role in government. A pure democracy, by which I mean a society consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person, can admit of no cure for the mischiefs of faction. Madison wrote in Federalist Number 10, the framers designed an American constitutional system not as a direct democracy, but as a representative republic, where enlightened delegates of the people, like, oh, I don't know, Scott de Jarlet, uh would serve the public good. But they also built into the Constitution a series of cooling mechanisms intended to inhibit the formulation of passionate factions to ensure that reasonable majorities would prevail. Whoops. The government cannot endure permanently if administered on a spoils basis. If this form of corruption is permitted and encouraged, other forms of corruption will inevitably follow in its train. Aha, that comes up again, in its train. How interesting. When a department at Washington or at a state capitol or in the city hall or in some big town is thronged with place hunters and office mongers who seek and dispense patronage, from consideration of personal and party greed, the tone of public life is necessarily so lowered, so lowered, I say, that the bribe taker and the bribe giver, the blackmailer and the corruptionist, find their places ready prepared for them. Well, let's see uh, whether there's more to this after this break. Uh, I just was reminded of seeing a writer on Twitter the other day who was writing a historic, well, a period piece, I guess, that uh, said, ooh, when you're using the words train of thought, realize that trains hadn't been invented yet. But trains hadn't been invented here either. Welcome back now to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. It occurs to me that... Uh, the layout in the Atlantic here of this piece is uh, such that we may have that last bit there. The government cannot endure permanently if administered on a spoils basis, et cetera, et cetera, which appeared to perhaps be a uh, continuation of Madison's writing in The Federalist, uh, may in fact have been a part of a piece that they are promoting here from the Atlantic Archives uh, falling under uh, the title of The Present Status of Civil Service Reform by Theodore Roosevelt in February of 1895, the February 1895 edition of The, uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, one, when trains had been invented. Uh, and two, that uh, that's, well, that would solve that interesting uh, dilemma. But it was an interesting thing, this discussion I noticed about this author, on Twitter saying, well, trains hadn't been invented, so you don't want to say train of thought in, say, a fantasy novel set in medieval times. And uh, what a strange uh, sort of uh, proofreading you had to do on your own work for issues like that. Although then other people uh, pointed out, well, the train wasn't a new word. It was just a new application of the word. And it meant pretty much the same thing, but there would certainly have been wagon trains or uh, you know, in the Silk Road, camel trains and the train of address would have been uh, something that people would be familiar with at the time. It didn't necessarily mean locomotive driven trains. But uh, while that would have been an interesting response to it, if that quote had been from James Madison, it might in fact have been from Teddy Roosevelt in February of 1895. Applicable to the story, but uh questionable as to why it is laid out in this fashion. And I guess the answer is, once again, the real problem here is that we are reading the AMP version of the story and not the original uh, uh, Atlantic layout of the story. And I bet that would... Uh, I don't see if this can solve it. Very often... 
having to uh, find myself having to find the original and I try to provide you with the original in the roundup posts that Scott puts together because I don't know I hate amp and I think it screws things up in ways like this let, let me see I'm just gonna scroll down through this yeah uh, this is really annoying um, where would we leave off with the actual article about Madison we had read that uh, right a, a pure democracy by which I mean a society consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person can admit of no cure for the mischief of faction. Madison wrote in Federalist Number 10, the framers designed the American constitutional system, you remember this, not as a direct democracy, but as a representative republic, where enlightened delegates of the people would serve the public good, but they also built into the Constitution a series of cooling mechanisms intended to inhibit the formulation of fa passion, passionate factions to ensure that reasonable majorities would prevail. Now, at that point, we jumped into the government cannot endure permanently if administered on a spoils basis. In the actual Atlantic layout, that is very clearly a sidebar, and it's presented as a sidebar, and it's very easy for the eye to skip past it and continue on with the article if necessary, though it is a very intriguing-looking sidebar and has a interesting sketch of Roosevelt there, and uh, I'm sure many alert readers would be interested in following their train of thought there at the Atlantic and reading this piece from their archives. But one of the real dangers of presenting this in the AMP format is AMP doesn't really do a very good job of differentiating between the sidebar material and the main body material. And very frequently you find yourself accidentally including, or at least I do, accidentally including in the main body of the article things that are not at all a part of the article and never were intended to be. But AMP screws with the layout and makes it very difficult to tell uh, where the main body of the article ends and where sidebars begin. So <clears throat> if we then switch over to the Atlantic's own layout, we can at least... Uh, avoid that problem and continue with the article. The people, Madison again here, the people would directly elect members of the House of Representatives, but the popular passions of the House would cool in the senatorial saucer, as George Washington purportedly called it. The Senate would comprise natural aristocrats chosen by state legislators rather than elected by the people, that one we've done away with some time ago, but, <clears throat> uh, well, it's still a, a, a relatively recent development. And uh, we certainly heard lots about the senatorial saucer, or at least that anecdote about senatorial saucer uh, purportedly from George Washington. And for the longest time, people insisted that what he meant by that was, the, people used that story to illustrate what they claimed was the founder's support for the deliberate debate in the Senate, including the filibuster, which is an amazing thing to claim because, of course, the filibuster had not yet been invented and was, I think, largely would have been considered an alien concept to uh, George Washington at the time in discussing the senatorial saucer. It was that, wasn't that they had the filibuster available to them because they didn't at the time but rather that it would be a debate among uh, rather detached aristocrats. And so that would be the cooling saucer, not the ability to uh, hold up any piece of legislation or executive action indefinitely by pretending to talk about it. Anyway, uh, as we said here, the Senate would comprise natural aristocrats chosen by state legislators rather than elected by the people, and rather than directly electing the chief executive, the people would vote for wise electors, that is, propertied white men, who would ultimately choose a president of the highest character and the most discerning judgment. We know how that went. The separation of powers, meanwhile, would prevent any one branch of government from acquiring too much authority. The further division of power between the federal and state governments would ensure that none of these three branches of government could claim that it alone represented the people. 
According to classical theory, republics only uh, could only exist in relatively small territories where citizens knew one another personally and could assemble face to face. Plato would have capped the number of citizens capable of self-government at 5,040. Why? I don't know. Especially since Athens was working with 6,000 as a bare minimum for a quorum. But okay. Madison, however, thought Plato's small republic thesis was wrong. He believed that the ease of communication in small republics was precisely what it allowed hastily formed majorities to oppress minorities. Extend the sphere of the territory, Madison wrote, and you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens, or if such common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength and to act in unison with each other. Hmm, interesting theory. Madison predicted that America's vast geography and large population would prevent passionate mobs from mobilizing. Their dangerous energy would burn out before it could inflame others. But, well, he didn't anticipate what comes next, right? Of course, at the time of the country's founding, new media technologies, including what Madison called a circulation of newspapers through the entire body of the people, were already closing the communications gap among the dispersed citizens of America, the popular press of the 18th and early 19th centuries was highly partisan. The National Gazette, where Madison himself published his thoughts on the media uh, since its founding in 1791, and his organization was an organ of the Democratic Republican Party and often viciously attacked by the Federal. Oh, often viciously attacked the Federalists, and I'm sure in turn was often viciously attacked by them. But newspapers of the time were also platforms for elites to make thoughtful arguments at length. And Madison believed that the enlightened journalists he called the literati would ultimately promote the commerce of ideas. He had faith that citizens would take the time to read complicated arguments, including the essays that became the Federalist Papers, allowing level-headed reason to slowly spread across the new republic. Well, it didn't work out all that well in the end. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, I guess, I mean, should we, should we continue with this or shall we get to the critique that I think was a good one that was offered? Uh, and I wonder whether it's easily identified or not, but we'll see if we can get that for you by post time. But, uh, the, a good critique, I think of this piece, although they haven't really come around to arguing about the mob yet, but. Not the not the mafia mob, but the idea that uh, expressed in the title, I guess, of the piece, the title and subtitle, um, that the founders designed a government that would be able to resist mob rule, and they didn't anticipate how strong the mob could become. And and true, as a uh, it was a failure of theirs to envision uh, modern communications techniques making it that much easier to assemble and direct a mob. But uh, I thought more to the point here was that uh, in reality, what ended up happening because of the, the founder's design was that, of course, Hillary Clinton got millions and millions more votes among the popular vote than Donald Trump did. And by rights, in some sense, should then have been considered to be the duly elected president. But the the wise electors who were supposed to stand in the way of electing a demagogue instead did exactly that. And interestingly, because I guess in the time since the founding of the Electoral College, we have apparently done a great deal to allegedly tie the hands of our electors such that they are prevented from exercising that independent judgment for which they are impaneled. At which point you might ask, why do we have this electoral college? And the answer is, it's just difficult to get rid of parts of the Constitution that have become antiquated because it requires uh, ratification and adoption of an amendment erasing it, and that's hard to do. By design, but it is hard to do. And the critique here was, yeah, you really have to take into account the fact that the mob, such as it is, that... Yeah, the, the, the larger faction of the population by far elected Hillary Clinton, not Donald Trump. And if Greg were here this week, he would remind you 
this so-called mob and how strong it has become, uh, comprises about 25% of the population. And through various mechanisms, some of which we can blame the Constitution for and others we can only blame interpretation of the Constitution for in later days, uh, we've set ourselves up in a situation where the popular will is relatively regularly thwarted by mobs that comprise far less than a majority of the people. And you should not lose sight of the fact that this mob that supposedly brought us Donald Trump comprises only a very small fraction. And, you know, uh, the the warning that uh, the founders didn't anticipate how strong mobs could become, uh, maybe they anticipated mobs rising to the level where they were able to enlist the sympathies of 25% of the population. After all, I guess you should also point out that's how the revolution was fought and won. But <clears throat> leaving that small point aside, uh, what is this mob? How strong is it really? And can you really blame the mob for this outcome when the real outcome, the, the actual election of Donald Trump is a result of this vaunted electoral college that's supposed to overcome the will of the mob, even though the will of the mob was likewise had already been overcome by the popular will. I find that whole thing rather amazing. And the fact that this doesn't so far account for that is a major oversight. That was the critique that I thought that made this piece so interesting in a backhanded way. James Madison, the piece continues, died at Montpelier, his Virginia estate, in 1836, one of the few founding fathers to survive into the democratic age of Andrew Jackson. Madison supported Jackson's efforts to preserve the Union against nullification efforts in the South, but was alarmed by his populist appeal in the West. What would Madison make of American democracy today, an era in which Jacksonian populism looks restrained by comparison? Madison's worst fears of mob rule have been realized, and the cooling mechanisms he designed to slow down the formulations of impetuous majorities have been broken. The polarization of Congress, reflecting an electorate that has not been this divided since about the time of the Civil War, has led to ideological warfare between parties that directly channels the passions of their most extreme constituents and donors, precisely the type of factionalism the founders abhorred. The executive branch, meanwhile, has been transformed by the spectacle of tweeting presidents, through the, though the presidency has broken from its constitutional restraints long before the advent of social media, during the election of 1912, the progressive populists Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson insisted that the president derived his authority directly from the people, and since then the office has moved in precisely the direction the founders had hoped to avoid. Presidents now make emotional appeals, communicate directly with voters, and pander to the mob. Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms have accelerated public discourse to warp speed, creating virtual versions of the mob. Inflammatory posts based on passion travel farther and faster than arguments based on reason. Rather than encouraging deliberation, mass media undermine it by creating bubbles and echo chambers in which citizens see only those opinions they already embrace. We are living, in short, in a Madisonian nightmare. How did we get here, and how can we escape? From the very beginning, the devices that the founders hoped would prevent the rapid mobilization of passionate majorities didn't work in all the ways they expected. After the election of 1800, the Electoral College, envisioned as a group of independent sages, became little more than a rubber stamp for the presidential nominees of newly emergent political parties. So uh, that was pretty early on, 1800. Hmm. You, we have realized no problems with it since then? The founders' greatest failure of imagination was not in anticipating the rise of mass political parties. The first parties played an unexpected cooling function, uniting diverse economic and regional interests through a shared constitutional vision. After the presidential elections of 1824, Martin Van Buren reconceived the Democratic Party as a coalition that would defend strict construction of the Constitution and states' rights in the name of the people, in contrast to the Federalist Party, which had controlled the federal courts, represented the moneyed classes, 
and sought to consolidate national power. As the historian Sean Willens has noted, the great movements for constitutional and social change in the 19th century, from the abolition of slavery to the progressive movement, were the product of strong and diverse political parties. Whatever benefits the parties offered in the 19th and early 20th centuries, however, have long since disappeared. The moderating effects of parties were undermined by a series of populist reforms, including the direct election of senators, the popular ballot initiative, and direct primaries and presidential elections, which became widespread in the 1970s. More recently, geographical and political self-sorting has produced voters and representatives who are willing to support the party line at all costs. After the Republicans took both chambers of Congress in 1994, the House of Representatives under Speaker Newt Gingrich adjusted its rules to enforce party discipline, taking power away from committee chairs and making it easier for leadership to push bills into law with little debate or support from across the aisle. The defining congressional achievements of Barack Obama's presidency, and thus far Donald Trump's, the Affordable Care Act of 2010, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, respectively, were passed with no votes, no votes, from the members of the minority party. Madison feared that Congress would be the most dangerous branch of the federal government, sucking power into its impetuous vortex. But today he would shudder at the power of the executive branch, the rise of what the presidential historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. called the imperial presidency has unbalanced the equilibrium among the three branches. Modern presidents rule by executive order rather than consulting with Congress. They direct a massive administrative state with jurisdiction over everything from environmental policy to the regulation of the airwaves. Trump's populist promise, I alone can fix it, is only the most dramatic in a long history of hyperbolic promises made by presidents from Wilson to Obama in order to mobilize their most ideologically extreme voters. During the 20th century, the Supreme Court also became both more powerful and more divided. The court struck down federal laws two times in the first 70 years of American history, just over 50 times in the next 75 years, and more than 125 times since 1934. Beginning with the appointment of Anthony Kennedy in 1987, the court became increasingly polarized between justices appointed by Republican presidents and justices appointed by Democratic presidents. Kennedy's retirement raises the likelihood of more constitutional rulings split between five Republican appointees and four Democratic ones. Exacerbating all this political antagonism is the development that might distress Madison the most, media polarization, which has allowed geographically dispersed citizens to isolate themselves into virtual factions, communicating only with like-minded individuals and reinforcing shared beliefs. Far from being a conduit for considered opinions by an educated elite, social media platforms, and old media platforms, I would argue, spread misinformation and inflame partisan differences. Indeed, people on Facebook and Twitter are more likely to share inflammatory posts that appeal to emotion than intricate arguments based on reason. The passions, hyperpartisanship, and split-second decision-making that Madison feared from large, concentrated groups meeting face-to-face -face have proven to be even more dangerous from exponentially larger dispersed groups that meet online. Is there any hope of resurrecting Madison's vision? of majority rule based on reason rather than passion? Uh, no. Unless the Supreme Court reinterprets the First Amendment, allowing the government to require sites like Twitter and Facebook to suppress polarizing speech that falls short of intentional incitement to violence, an ill-advised and at the moment thankfully unlikely prospect, any efforts to encourage deliberation on those platforms will have to come from the platforms themselves. For the moment, they have adopted an unsatisfying mashup of American and European approaches to free speech. Mark Zuckerberg provoked controversy recently when he said Facebook wouldn't remove posts denying the existence of the Holocaust because determining the intent of the poster was impossible, but would continue to ban hate speech that the First Amendment protects. Still, some promising, if modest, fixes are on the horizon, 
Nathaniel Persili, a professor at Stanford Law School who leads an independent commission that will examine the impact of Facebook on democracy, notes one step the company has taken to address the problem of clickbait, which lures users with sensational headlines, articles that persuade many users to click previously appeared high on Facebook's newsfeed. The company now prioritizes those articles users have actually taken the time to read. But these and other solutions could have First Amendment implications. The democratic character of the Internet is itself posing a threat to democracy, and there's no clear solution to the problem, Persili told me. Censorship, delay, demotion of information online, deterrence, and dilution of bad content all pose classic free speech problems, and everyone should be concerned at every step of the government regulatory parade. Of course... The Internet can empower democratic deliberation as well as threaten it, allowing dissenters to criticize the government in ways the founders desired. The Internet has also made American democracy more inclusive than it was in the founders' day, amplifying the voices of women, minorities, and other disadvantaged groups they excluded. And although our national politics is deadlocked by partisanship, compromise remains possible at the local level, where activism, often organized online, can lead to real change. Federalism remains the most robust and vibrant Madisonian cooling mechanism and continues to promote ideological diversity. At the moment, the combination of low voter turnout and ideological extremism has tended to favor very liberal or very conservative candidates in primaries. Thanks to safe districts created by geographic self-sorting and partisan gerrymandering, many of these extremists go on to win the general election. Today, all congressional Republicans fall to the right of the most conservative Democrat, and all congressional Democrats fall to the left of the most liberal Republican. In the 1960s, at times, 50% of the lawmakers overlapped ideologically. Voters in several states are experimenting with alternative primary systems that might elect more moderate representatives. California and Washington State have adopted a top-two system, in which candidates from both parties compete in a nonpartisan primary, and the two candidates who get the most votes run against each other in a general election, even if they're from the same party. States, which Louis Brandeis called laboratories of democracy, are proving to be the most effective way to encourage deliberation at a time when Congress acts only along party lines. The best way of promoting a return to Madisonian principles, however, may be One Madison has himself identified constitutional education. In recent years, calls for more civic education have become something of a national refrain, but the framers themselves believed that the fate of the republic depended on an educated citizenry. Drawing again on his studies of ancient republics, which taught that broad education of citizens was the best security against crafty and dangerous encroachments on the public liberty, Madison insisted that the rich should subsidize the education of the poor. To combat the power of factions, the founders believed that the people had to be educated about the structures of government in particular. A popular government, without popular information or the means of acquiring it, is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Madison wrote in 1822, supporting the Kentucky legislature's plan of education embracing every class of citizens. In urging Congress to create a national university in 1796, George Washington said a primary object of such a national institution should be the education of our youth in the sciences of government. The science of government. The civics half of the educational equation is crucial. Recent studies have suggested that higher education can polarize citizens rather than ensuring the rule of reason. Highly educated liberals became more liberal and highly educated conservatives more conservative. At the same time, the national assessment of educational progress has found that citizens, whether liberal or conservative, who are educated about constitutional checks on direct democracy, such as an independent judiciary, are more likely to express trust in the courts and less likely to call for judicial impeachment or for overturning unpopular Supreme Court decisions. These are dangerous times. The percentage of people who say it is essential to live in a liberal democracy is plummeting everywhere from the United States to the Netherlands. Support for autocratic alternatives to democracy is especially high among young people. Hmm. 
1788, Madison wrote that the best argument for adopting a Bill of Rights would be its influence on public opinion. As the political truths declared in the Bill of Rights became incorporated with the national sentiment, he concluded they would counteract the impulses of interest and passion. Today, passion has gotten the better of us. The preservation of the Republic urgently requires imparting constitutional principles to a new generation and reviving Madisonian reason in an impetuous world. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> we'll be back in two minutes to laugh a little bit more about it. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I think that is it. We've wrapped it up and gotten all of that uh, article from the Atlantic in. And, uh, well, you know, I mean, it was very interesting to think about. It didn't really address, as we said uh, initially, being the critique, uh, the difficulties with the Electoral College. And I can't really, I don't know if I can envision for you an Electoral College system that would be accepted by the vast majority of voters that really reasserts the independence of electors. I just don't think that people would be comfortable in this day and age with the idea that they could express a clear opinion statewide, even if we just, I guess if we just keep it as is, if you express a clear opinion on an election statewide and then just have someone show up and say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to vote the other way or I'm not going to I'm going to withhold my votes at least from the leading candidate or I'm going to vote for somebody else entirely. <clears throat> but uh I'm also not really sure by what mechanism we would be able reliably and uniformly to reform or to test I guess the constitutionality of state statutes purporting to bind the hands of their electors. Uh, it, it, it'd be very difficult, I think, to iron that out in a consistent fashion. And I'm not certain that even a, I mean, even a court challenge to, I mean, I guess you couldn't, certainly couldn't overturn the results of a previous election, though you could certainly, I guess, I mean, I don't even know. Some courts would be such sticklers with the standing issue that it would be very difficult to get into court to challenge the constitutionality of a state law requiring electors to vote with, you know, to, to reflect the will of the majority of the voters in your state. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I imagine that those laws, I mean, the, the laws were adopted in accordance with, I think, the same feeling that I think would make it impossible to preserve and bring back to its original intent, <clears throat> which I don't think was ever particularly brilliant, the Electoral College. I, I don't I don't see how you get to a point where people say, yeah, I'm willing to risk it. I suppose you could change the mechanism by which members of the Electoral College are appointed and not allow the campaigns themselves to direct the appointments, but I don't know I don't know if I could design, certainly not on the fly, an alternative method of naming people to the Electoral College that people could possibly accept. I mean, I, essentially, I think the, uh, the, the time for the Electoral College is over. I, people expect at this point the direct election of the president. They really do. And, and I guess, uh, 
that it ought to be done by, I mean, I don't see why it shouldn't be done by the popular vote. I understand the initial uh, drive to say, for instance, uh, to come up with a mechanism to make certain that the voices of voters in the less populous and more remote states are heard. But, uh, well, this one has been of, of little to no use and was of little to no use almost immediately, as we read in the article. Almost right away, in 1800, the Electoral College became a joke. All right, well, moving on to other stories uh, not necessarily immediately tied to this one, or even, for that matter, to Donald Trump himself. I just thought I would... Uh, Poke around a little bit. Let's see. I got a few things that I could think would be well advised to save for Friday. This is a piece that I picked up uh, thanks to the tweets of the trace that uh, follow gun issues very closely. And rather than take their tweet, though, I took the actual GAO report that underlies it. Uh, this is, I, I don't know whether it makes sense to surf through this whole thing. I guess it's not extensive, but it's pretty dry. But uh, here's the, the gist of it, of course, is summed up in the headline. That's what headlines do. <clears throat> Law enforcement says this. Few individuals denied firearms purchases are prosecuted, and ATF should assess its use of warning notices in lieu of prosecutions. This is a GAO publication as dry as could possibly be. Fast facts, though, they provide for us up at the top. Individuals who submit falsified information on a form needed to purchase a firearm, e.g. do not disclose a felony conviction, may be subject to investigation and prosecution. We knew this to be true, and you probably suspected the rest of this to be true. In fiscal 2017, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives referred about 12,700 denied purchases to its field divisions for investigation. As of June 2018, U.S. Attorney's Office has prosecuted 12 of these cases. ATF field divisions may send warning notices to denied persons in lieu of persecution, but this practice varies among divisions. We recommend that ATF assess field division's use of warning notices and determine if policy changes are needed. And uh, it goes on to state here, individuals must sign the ATF form 4473 to certify that they are not prohibited from purchasing firearms. That's the form you fill out when it's time to buy a gun. And it may never really be time to buy a gun, but if you determine that it is, why well, you have that right. The upshot of this, though... 12,700 people during fiscal year uh, 2017 were denied purchases of firearms based on what they put on the, their forms. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so basically what they're saying is out of the 12,000, well, one in a thousand are actually prosecuted for something when they either falsify the information on the form or disclose something that uh, denies them the right to buy a firearm, but also discloses to the federal government that there's something, well, that needs looking into there. I just found it an interesting headline, uh, and so did the trace. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that people sometimes, uh, well, particularly gun enthusiasts, will frequently say, well, uh, we don't need more gun laws. We need to enforce the ones we already have on the books. Of course... Of course, you'll you'll realize that, well, that usually comes out of the mouths of NRA types who, of course, consider the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives to be uh, enemies of the people. And they very they're particularly glad, I think, to see. And I think the numbers of prosecutions are so low because it's been their activism and agitation and working of the refs that have convinced the government that it's not worth their time to do this. So the same people who say don't add new laws, enforce the ones already on the books, have made it their business to insist that the ones already on the books not be enforced. I just found that rather interesting and thought I'd share it with you. It's a small tidbit, and we can move on from there 
to other fun things. Uh, let's see. This looks like a could be a Friday piece here too. But if I have too many too long Friday pieces, we'll never get through any of them. Let's see. Uh, a couple of reminders of Brett Kavanaugh's unfitness for office, uh, including this piece from just before the weekend, last weekend, in Slate, asking the question, so no one's going to ask Brett Kavanaugh about how he got into massive debt by allegedly buying baseball tickets? It's too bad that no one decided to do that during the hearings, and I guess that's coming up individually now, but uh, no senators I know of making a big enough deal out of this. This is a piece in Slate by Ben Mathis Lilly. And I think we might be able to get through this one rather quickly, but just in case you didn't get the details of his excuse for uh, all the holes in his financial disclosure, Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee have attacked Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination from a number of angles during his confirmation hearings this week, suggesting that he twists the law to achieve right-wing ideological goals, that he's been propped up with the help of sleazy tactics that have hidden his record from the public, and has been nominated in part to protect Donald Trump from Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation. One thing Democrats haven't asked Kavanaugh about and don't appear to plan to, given that their time to ask direct questions has run out, is the weird story of his personal debt. As first reported by the Washington Post, and I now realize as I'm reading this that I am reading to you from what? What do you think? Yes, the AMP version. <clears throat> of this story and it's only going to get me into trouble so let's see if we can get to the original instead there we are and read it from that uh that posting instead okay so as first reported by the washington post kavanaugh's financial disclosure forms indicate that as of 2016 he carried somewhere between 60 and 200 thousand dollars in debt on three credit cards plus a personal loan the White House's explanation for why a successful 53-year-old lawyer and judge would have that much credit card debt was that Kavanaugh really liked going to baseball games. And that seems like an unwise way, reason to take on so much debt. White House spokesman Rod Shaw, we were told, told the Washington Post that Kavanaugh built up the debt by buying Washington Nationals season tickets and tickets for playoff games for himself and a handful of friends. Shaw said some of the debts were also for home improvements. A ProPublica piece about Kavanaugh's tickets notes that he's been seen at national games in seats near first base. Season tickets at the dugout premier price level in that area would cost about $9,000 a year. Therefore, the judge would have had to have fronted the cost of seven such top-level season tickets just to reach the lower limit of what his debt was said to be. In 2017, all of Kavanaugh's debt besides his home mortgage was gone, which the White House says was because Kavanaugh's friends reimbursed him for their share of the baseball tickets. The administration wouldn't provide any more details. Incidentally, in one of the previously undisclosed emails from Kavanaugh's time in George W. Bush's White House that was released on Thursday, he apologizes to several friends for growing aggressive after blowing still another game of dice during a weekend trip, and then instructs them to be very, very vigilant with respect to confidentiality on all issues and all fronts, including with spouses. That was what Joan mentioned the other day, the game of dice. Uh, does he have a gambling problem? That is strange. And it's interesting, too, that he uh, is apologizing to his friends, of all people, for growing aggressive. And I guess uh, you one might wonder, even if you have no problem personally with gambling, whether or not that might affect his demeanor on the court if he were to blow another game of dice. By the way, just thinking about the baseball tickets things, as they said, you'd have to buy seven sets of tickets, seven season tickets to approach the lower limit of the debt he reported. And all seven friends, by the way, you'd have to agree to float season tickets for seven people and all seven of them would have to fail to pay you back so, I mean, I guess you could say maybe he floated, maybe he did it for 14 or 15 friends and half of them didn't pay him back. Now, he doesn't seem to be getting aggressive about that, I guess. Doesn't apologize to them about that. I would just, you, you got to wonder about 
the, uh, well, what kind of friends is this guy who moves in these professional circles keeping that they ask him, yeah, why don't you float me the season tickets and we'll hang out together there all season, but I won't pay you back. And then I'll force you to put down $200,000 worth of debt on your financial disclosure forms, knowing that you work in the government. Uh, and enjoy the baseball all along, by the way. That's, I mean, it's pretty amazing that uh, the judge wouldn't have sold off their tickets at some point. All right. Well, at any rate, to be fair to Kavanaugh, the dice comment could have been tongue in cheek and the confidentiality could have referred to work related discussions rather than personal chicanery. But we don't know because no one on the Senate Judiciary Committee asked him to explain it. I'm not a master of jurisprudential ethics, but I've read a few thrillers, and it seems like having a Supreme Court justice who likes to gamble and racks up huge debts that he explains implausibly and which disappear mysteriously may not be the best idea as far as preventing potential corruption or conflicts of interest. Right? Well, right. And yet, we haven't heard a word about it. Uh, but, you know, I think the members of the Judiciary Committee acquitted themselves well. But uh, I want to reiterate something else we mentioned yesterday with Joan. As more and more reports come in of certain Democratic senators still essentially saying that they are unconvinced or haven't made up their mind about Kavanaugh. I did read about Heidi Heitkamp the other day saying just that. And she's not made up her mind. And uh, But that uh, the hearings, she said, hadn't raised any red flags for her, which I found pretty amazing. And going back to part of the discussion I had with Joan yesterday uh, and making the same point, essentially. I am I am surprised that she would say such a thing, although, I mean, that's the role that a senator like that often plays. But I am hopeful that in private discussions among members of the Democratic, the Senate Democratic Caucus, they might raise the issue with her that at least purportedly Several of her Democratic colleagues risked expulsion from the Senate in order to raise those red flags, but Heidi Heitkamp has not bothered to look for them, has not acknowledged seeing them. Imagine being a member of the Senate and risking expulsion from the Senate, uh, even though no one ever really believed that that was going to be the penalty. But, you know, it's not nice to get threatened with it, and it's not nice to get threatened with it on television either, where many, many people will come away with the belief that that could have happened, and so that, therefore, the uh, exposure of these communications that were marked committee confidential was, in fact, some sort of serious crime. Imagine taking that risk only to find out that Heidi Heitkamp hadn't noticed and was continuing to refuse to notice. No red flags were raised. What do we think was going on here? I mean, it may be that she paid no attention to the hearing. There was another important hearing going on, and she may have been paying attention to neither one of them. But at some point, you got to acknowledge, hey, I've seen some concerns raised, and I have to ponder them. I have to give them some thought. Not, I don't believe that they were raised. I didn't see that they happened. That's got to be somewhat discomforting, I would think, to her colleagues. All right. Let's see. Other things that uh, we might share about this, I guess perhaps, uh, why don't we stay with Slate and with Brett Kavanaugh for the moment and read this rather interesting entry into all of this uh, from Lisa Graves, who I remember from her uh, activism in uh, anti-ALEC work. Uh, ALEC Exposed, I believe, was largely uh, uh, her work. And she writes this piece here in Slate, although I'm wondering, am I also once again looking at it from the AMP perspective? Sometimes it's hard to tell whether or not you are. I see a, an ad for AMP right up top here, but it doesn't appear from the URL that I'm over in there. Uh, jurisdiction. But uh, the title of the piece here, I wrote some of the stolen memos that Brett Kavanaugh lied to the Senate about. He should be impeached, not elevated. And uh, well, sounds rather serious. Much of Washington has spent the week last week focusing on whether Judge Brett Kavanaugh should be confirmed to the Supreme Court after revelations of his confirmation hearings 
The better question is whether he should be impeached from the federal judiciary. I do not raise the question lightly, but I am certain it must be raised. Newly released emails show that while he was working to move through President George W. Bush's judicial nominees in the early 2000s, Kavanaugh received confidential memos, letters, and talking points of Democratic staffers stolen by GOP Senate aide Manuel Miranda. That includes research and talking points Miranda stole from the Senate server after I had written them for the Senate Judiciary Committee as the chief counsel for nominations for the minority. Receiving those memos and letters alone is not an impeachable offense. No, Kavanaugh should be removed because he was repeatedly asked under oath as part of his 2004 and 2006 confirmation hearings for his position on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit about whether he had received such information from Miranda, and each time he falsely denied it. For example, in 2004, Senator Orrin Hatch asked him directly if he had received any documents that appeared to you to have been drafted or prepared by Democratic staff members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Kavanaugh responded unequivocally, no. In 2006, Ted Kennedy asked him if he had any regrets about how he treated documents he received from Miranda. This is at the point at which they know he did receive them. Uh, that he later learned were stolen. Kavanaugh rejected the premise of the question, restating that he never saw even one of these documents. <clears throat> Back then, the senators did not have the emails that they have now, showing that Miranda sent Kavanaugh numerous documents containing what was plainly researched by Democrats. Some of those emails went uh, so far as to warn Kavanaugh not to distribute the Democratic talking points he was being given, if these were documents shared from the Democratic side of the aisle as part of the normal business, as Kavanaugh claimed to have believed in his most recent testimony, why would they be labeled not for distribution? And why would we share our precise strategy to fight controversial Republican nominations with the Republicans we were fighting? Another email chain included the subject line spying. We talked about that one. It's hard to imagine a more definitive clue than that. Another said, Senator Leahy's staff has distributed a confidential letter to Dem Council and then described for Kavanaugh that precise confidential information we had gathered about a nominee Kavanaugh was boosting. Again, it's illogical to think that we would have just given Miranda this confidential information for him to use against us. But this is precisely what Judge Kavanaugh suggested in his testimony last Wednesday. He is not that naive. In the hearing this week, Senator Leahy also noted that the previously hidden emails showed that Miranda asked to meet Kavanaugh in person to give him paper files with useful info to map out Senators Joe Biden and Dianne Feinstein and others. The promised information included Biden speak. Again, this would not have been a normal information exchange. In response to Leahy's questions this week, which was actually last week, Kavanaugh made the outlandish claim that it was typical for him to be told what Democrats planned to ask at these combative hearings over controversial nominees. Hmm, that does seem rather odd. Uh, and that this was, in fact, the coin of the realm, as he put it. As a Democrat who worked on those, quotation, uh, on those questions, sorry, I can definitively say it was not typical at all. Kavanaugh knows this full well. At the time, Kavanaugh was working with Miranda and outside groups to try to force these nominees through the Senate over Democratic objections, and it would have been suicide to give them our research, talking points, strategies, or confidential letters. The Republican senators, their staff, the White House, and outside groups were working intensively to undermine the work of Democratic senators to block the most extreme of President Bush's nominees. The Leahy talking points given to Kavanaugh were from my in-depth research into why the Senate had compelling uh, historical precedent for examining Miguel Estrada's Department of Justice records, which the White House Counsel's Office was refusing to surrender. Mm -hmm, gee whiz. Miguel Estrada, by the way, was blocked. And over that refusal to turn over the documents. They're not going to make that same mistake again, apparently. The Republicans have decided other confidential materials Miranda shared with Kavanaugh related to investigations Democrats were pursuing over how Judge Priscilla Owen had handled an abortion case involving parental consent and about the overlap between her funders and groups with business before the courts of Texas. We would never have provided that information. Our key, the key to our strategy, it, uh, it was rather key to our strategy to try to block 
what we considered extremist judicial nominations to Miranda or the White House. During his testimony, Kavanaugh conflated these adversarial proceedings with ones in which Democrats might have cooperated with the other side, like the Patriot Act and airline liability. But these weren't hearings on some bill where senators would share their concerns across the aisle to get a bipartisan fix on problems in a piece of legislation. These were oppositional proceedings in committee and on the floor over controversial judicial nominees. Again, you can't amend a nominee, right? Kavanaugh knew this just as intimately as I did. Our sides fought over these nominations intensely. It was also an area in which Kavanaugh's Judicial Nominations Alliance had taken a scorched-earth approach, attacking Democrats ruthlessly. The White House's closest allies went so far as to call Leahy and other Democrats on the committee anti-Catholic and even running attack ads. Perhaps Kavanaugh was so blindsided by his quest to get the most controversial Bush nominees confirmed in 2003 that he did not have any concerns about the bounty of secret memos and letters he was receiving, the full extent of which is not known because so many documents are still secret. But surely, reasonable questions about what he had been party to would have been considered after the story of the theft exploded in the news. Miranda was forced to resign, and the U.S. Senate Sergeant-at-Arms began a bipartisan investigation into the files stolen from the Senate. As of November 2003, when the Sergeant-at-Arms seized the Judiciary Committee's servers, Kavanaugh would have been on notice that any of the letters, talking points, or research described as being from Democrats that were provided to him by Miranda were suspect and probably stolen from the Senate's servers. But he did nothing. He didn't come forward to the Senate to provide information about the confidential documents Miranda had given him, which were clearly from the Democrats. Kavanaugh also apparently did nothing when the Senate referred the case to the U.S. Attorney's Office for criminal prosecution. Miranda was never prosecuted, by the way. Eventually, though, Kavanaugh went even further to help cover up the details of the theft. During the hearings on his nomination to the D.C. Circuit a few months after the Miranda news broke, Kavanaugh actively hid his own involvement, lying to the Senate Judiciary members by stating unequivocally that he not only knew nothing of the episode, but also had never seen even, or even received any stolen material. Even if Kavanaugh could claim that he didn't have any hint at the time he received the emails that these documents were of suspect provenance, which I personally find implausible, there is no reasonable way for him to assert honestly that he had no idea what they were after the revelation of the theft. Any reasonable person would have realized they had been stolen. And certainly someone as smart as Kavanaugh would have too. But he lied under oath. And he did so repeatedly. Significantly, he did so even though a few years earlier he had helped spearhead the impeachment of President Bill Clinton for perjury in a private civil case. Back then, Kavanaugh took lying under oath so seriously that he was determined to do everything he could to help remove a president from office. Now we know that he procured his own confirmation to the federal bench by committing the same offense. And he did so not in a private case, but in the midst of public hearings for a position of trust for a lifetime appointment to the federal judiciary. His actions were dishonorable and dishonest. This week, as part of his efforts to be elevated to the highest court in the land, he has calmly continued to deceive, falsely claiming that it would have been perfectly normal for him to receive secret Democratic letters, talking points, and other materials. And if this absurd notion were somehow true, it would not even be consistent with what he testified to 12 and 14 years ago. Back then, he didn't state it would have been normal for him to receive secret Democratic strategy materials. Instead, he explicitly and repeatedly went out of his way to say he never had access to any such materials. These objectively false statements were offered under oath to convince the committee of something that was untrue. It was clearly intentional, with Kavanaugh going so far as to correct Senator Kennedy when the senator described the document situation accurately. That's why, without even getting into other reasonable objections to his nomination, he could not be, should not be confirmed. In fact, by his own standard, he should be impeached. Well, there you have it. Lisa Graves, by the way, co-founder of Documented, which investigates corporate influence on democracy. She is the former chief counsel for nominations and the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and, or rather for the ranking member, and was deputy assistant attorney general in the Department of Justice. 
So uh, nothing new in terms of disclosures or finding out more evils perpetrated by Kavanaugh there, but just a good personal look at uh, what was obvious at the time and particularly after. I mean, once Manuel Miranda got busted and the Senate sergeant-at-arms had seized the servers, you had pretty much every reason to believe that all the information you had gotten was perhaps suspect after all. Just as, for instance... If you were involved in the Trump campaign and thought you had meetings which you believed to be innocent with, let's say, representatives of the Russian government or Russian intelligence services, you might now take a second look at those and say, gee whiz, have I done something here to put myself in jeopardy? You might want to cover it up, but you at least, at the very least, would know exactly what you had been involved in. All right, time to hand the mic over. To Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, we can get a little bit of the details of what he's got in store store for you after this. And then we'll be back to do this again on Friday. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Cake Room in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Check this out. Holocaust deniers are apparently now advertising on the Bay Area Rapid Transit System. And San Francisco transit officials say they have no choice but to allow the ads. Also elsewhere, a Republican schemes to sabotage Obamacare one more time before the midterms. And much, much more, as always, coming up next, right here.